There have been so many changes in the past 30 years since I've worked in the business that they're too numerous to count. But probably the biggest one has been the increase of social media. We come from a history of humanity that is all about communication between two people. And then we go to a broadcast communication style for the last 100, 150 years. Once the public was allowed to communicate back with us and this two-way dialogue was re-established, I think it was a game changer for not just the journalism industry, but PR, marketing, across every industry and all sectors and categories. Who isn't involved in kind of the digital aspects of virtually everything that they do? So, I mean, if there's any one change, it's just the going from the unusual to the ubiquity of digital and its impact, not just on communications, but on business overall. If we look at these social media influencers and their ability to publish and amplify content to large audience segments, this is a paradigm shift in how we do business. Today, social media influencers are the new royalty. Influencers have always been an important tool for brands because it is more powerful when someone else is talking about you or your product in a positive way than when you are. It gives you this third party credibility. It's sort of an endorsement. It used to be that our, the main influencers we dealt with in public relations were media. The conversation used to be about five, ten years ago, what magazine covers do you have? What magazine covers do you have? That was the thing. People don't even talk about magazines anymore. Between Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, Reddit, I mean that's the place where you can see where the cultural conversation is going. So we've had to adapt to that. People are reading about entertainment almost less looking for factual information as looking for recommendations or looking at what's hot or what people are talking about. Because not only do they want to have their time sort of mitigated by only paying attention to the things that, that are hot or people are talking about, they also want to be part of the conversation. So those people, friends, family, people they may follow like influencers that you're talking about sort of sift through the madness and say out of the 300 things that are in front of you right now these are the five that you should pay attention to. We just used to have radio, television, and print and now you have dozens of social channels that are ways to reach people and also have conversations with them. So that's changed the whole dynamic of our business. I remember it was novel that you know, a brand would say, oh my gosh, people are talking about us on Twitter. What are they saying? And they would freak out about every little criticism. That really grew an awareness of the power of it on a slightly negative standpoint, but then there was a growing awareness that, oh, we could influence that conversation or we could learn from those valid criticisms and improve our products and build a better relationship by being uh, good listeners and hearing from our customers. Companies in the last several years have uh, seen an opportunity to become much more aggressive about self-publishing. So companies are much more in the business of content creation and syndication. The attitude is if we don't tell our story, who will? Technology, social channels, platforms, and so forth kind of provide a way in which they can do that. So, you know, virtually every company today sees themselves as a publisher of one sort or another. It's interesting what some of these large brands are doing now around content marketing. If you look at Marriott and their creation of their content studio, is they're putting a flag in the ground and saying, look, we are a media company. Having said that, the impact of that publishing and the impact of that syndication is still directly linked to how effective they are at getting influencers to embrace that content and share that content. You know, about 85% of consumers want more of a humanized, two-way communication uh, type of relationship with their companies on social and digital. But only about 20% believe that that's actually happening. The way they used to create content was in a vacuum, one-way communications. They used to think about what's the new product, what's the initiative that we really need to get there. Let's create a, a one picture or one video and we'll put it out across Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, YouTube. Now each platform has a different type of person that follows that. Those are different types of content and different types of people. Consumers are very savvy, right? 
especially younger, as you get to the millennials, millennials are very savvy, they understand where you're trying to, you know, don't try to sell me this, don't try to push me this, and I, you can immediately see, see that. And when this connection is not organic, you immediately switch the channel. You immediately press stop on your, on your browser player because you understand that it's not honest. The challenge is to find these content pieces that are, one, obviously connected to a certain extent to the brand, but also connected to the consumer in an emotional level. In order to do that, you need to really work with people who are part of that group, bringing in uh, what we call now influencers. I would say the first time I really noticed the power of influencers rising um, was when I was working at Google and I was helping launch Google Plus. Um, and at first our primary focus was to identify celebrities. As we were working with celebrities, we actually realized that there was these other communities of people um, who had followings that were just as big, if not bigger, and maybe their numbers weren't as big, but the engagement was a lot bigger. So the power that those influencers had in a lot of ways was actually more impactful than the power we saw that the celebrities having. How's it going, Rose? My spirit. If you're on the internet and you want to find out something, we all pretty much go to Google. So I'm going to do, inspired by my girlfriend, Google myself. So I'm going to type, is PewDiePie, and then we get- There are people who exist outside of that traditional power structure and traditional ways of getting their voice across. So maybe they blog, but they're not a journalist, um, but still have a significant following and a significant number of people that are listening to them. We've been influencing behavior one person to another forever, but digital and social media have allowed for that to scale. That scale is unprecedented, that an individual who may or may not be of a post of authority or uh, you know, be famous or have their television show or be a big personality of some kind, um, they can earn an audience over time and, and be an influencer from their living room, from their computer. You know, people often ask me, why don't I reply to negative comments? And that's because I only have two sides. I really see influencers as the sort of real embodiment of the social media revolution. For social media, we've seen tremendous changes from 2000 through 2017. First, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, the introduction of blogging platforms. We move from there to sites like YouTube that came along in 2005, which was very transformative in how we publish and consume video content. After 2005, we saw Facebook opening to the public. It was no longer only for university students, but became open to the public in 2006. That was the same year that Twitter also launched and was this sort of odd little platform that had uh, 140 characters on it. 2010, Instagram launched itself. 2011 was the beginning of Snapchat that came along. Facebook then bought Instagram in 2012. Twitter bought the Vine platform in 2012. Tremendous changes in growth here. If I had told you in 2004 or 2005 that your MySpace page, your fabulously bedazzled MySpace page, was no longer going to exist in a couple years, most people wouldn't have believed me. But the fact of the matter is, social media, the social web, it has changed tremendously in the last 15 years. It's dynamic and changing. It doesn't stand still. Social media in general and YouTube specifically, um, and really all the platforms that have become famous at this point, really didn't start as commerce-based uh, society. And today we're bringing you the winners who, according to Forbes, are making bank this year. YouTube started in 2005 um, just to tackle a technological problem at that time, which was the difficulties in transfer video. Um, it had no intention to become a video destination. It had no intention to become an entertainment destination. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you about that vlog life. 100, 100 days of me recording my life and getting to There was a point in time, and, and I'm very happy to say that I, that I was part of it. Uh, and it was around 2010, 2011, when once we figured it out the intellectual property protection system, and we made pieces, 
with everyone that produces intellectual property, that's when we started to understand that we had people at the platform creating content and aggregating a very large audience around their content. Those audiences were going from these intimate crowds that they could know one-to-one -one into uh, crowds that they were really performing for, you know, indirectly. And you really went from a friend network to an audience. And I think a lot of those uh, creators realized that and started, to, um, and started to refine what they were doing. I am your host, Corey Vidal, and you're watching my show. And I'm trying to figure out what would make people come back to my videos and, uh, and what, what can keep people's attention for more than five minutes. Because um, people lose attention really quickly. Um, already, this is probably getting too long, so I'm going to cut right here. I've been posting on YouTube for two years, uh, all kinds of videos of me sharing some of my random talents that I have. I dance, I play guitar, and I sing, kind of the main three. I also do some acting here and there, um, and some of the videos I've posted have gotten a lot of hits, and uh, in turn I ended up with a lot of subscribers. So YouTube ended up actually making me a partner. Nobody ever considered this would make the money. It was just, how do we get people to watch our stuff? I'm not quite sure how you have this planned. I don't. Okay. That's the beauty of YouTube. Hi, it's Anya. Oh, shut up. I hate that intro. I'm a filmmaker and a producer. It's what I moved to LA to do originally. And I met a bunch of people who were like, YouTube's really cool, we're making stuff. And I was like, oh, I, made, I make some stuff. So we started to work together and make things together and try and figure out um, how this YouTube thing was working. And we were like, oh, if you upload at 2 p.m. on a Tuesday, uh, it does better than if you upload at 9 a.m. on a Wednesday. So everybody would be like, oh, okay, I'll do that too. And then we figured out thumbnails. If you make them look this way, you're, it'll get more clicks. So we, we were kind of figuring out how the whole thing worked. And so I became part of that community. Hey Tanya, the space. Slowly, it started to grow, and that initial group of people became the first YouTube millionaires. Um, I think most of them are still around. Still millionaires. It happened because we were the very first platform that empowered people. For the very, very first time, we're giving people the ability to broadcast <laughs> themselves. Hey. Welcome to Shea Loss, the weight loss vlog where you're not fat. We're not picking the winners. The audience is picking the winners. So I think because we were the very first platform to empower people, we got this massive amount of young storytellers, many of them extremely knowledgeable, extremely talented, telling their stories to the world. <laughs> I decided to uh, put up a song of my daughter and I singing and by accident, it was all by accident, it ended up going viral on YouTube. I started getting reached out by a bunch of people, a lot of, a lot of media attention for the past two, three years and to this day actually. And um, I decided to, to, to go even deeper. So, you know, singing songs with my daughter was fun and stuff like that and then I realized um, um, I was given an idea of like vlogging. I'm like, what is vlogging? You know, and I and I realized that I've been vlogging my whole life, recording my kids' mo memories and doing and talking to myself on the camera. I thought I was crazy, but um, I wasn't crazy. I was vlogging. So then, a light bulb hit. You know, I'm <clears throat> getting ready to apply for law school, for graduate school, mm -hmm. and I decided to do this instead. I decided to become a YouTuber. <laughs> just share my life to the world, focusing on family, community, art, and music, and, and really talking about things that matter to me, um, like immigration and everything I just said, and, and things that I care about. I really do really care about this, and I, I really want to share this to the world, so I decided to do it out of fun and like really inspire people. I like to think about it as like influencer, you know, influencers 1.0, right? The reason why is, it's really challenging to make good video content. The level of complexity is higher than an image. It's tough to 
find people who are really passionate about editing video and creating that content so your pool of influencers or potential influencers is much smaller. You look at a platform like Instagram or a lot of these mobile social platforms, they're image based. So you don't need to edit it. You don't have to have any sort of knowledge uh, on how to create the content. You can just you know, plug and play. And so we saw a much larger pool of, of potential influencers and we saw a much lower barrier to entry to creating good content. So you put those together and rather than seeing a handful of influencers emerge, we're seeing tens of thousands. As social media itself evolves and as we see new platforms, there's going to be the people who get it first. There's a whole different breed of influencers on Snapchat that didn't pick up YouTube and put it on Snapchat. They understood Snapchat as something inherently different. They understood that this whole concept of writing on the video is new. And so you've got people like GeoSnap and Myology and these uh, and Sean Doris. These people who weren't influencers on other channels, but latched onto this thing so quickly and so natively, it was unbelievably creative. And then you do see other people copy them. You see brands copy them and follow them. Staying relevant, it's a lot of work. There's new apps all the time, and you don't know which ones are gonna take off and which won't, so you have to, you have to get on them all. Um, Musical.ly is blowing up right now. I don't know why. You know, and if you didn't get on early enough, you're out. I've grown as technology's grown. So right now, a really big thing that we have in the world of technology is live stream. So I was on live stream very early on. Uh, at, back then we had Meerkat and I was one of the top Meerkatters and then we had Periscope. When I found out that now Periscope was coming out and you could save it on your phone, I was like, yes! The tech gods have like kissed down on me and my, my efforts. So I dug into Periscope very quickly uh, and very deeply. What is up, what is up everybody? Happy with I'm proud to say I'm uh, the top Latina Periscoper, continue to be. Uh, I'm actually nominated for a Shorty Award this year for Periscoper of the Year. For me, um, I've always had a natural inclination for technology, so being able to really combine that, and more importantly, being able to use it as a pipeline for me to share what I go through with the hopes of inspiring them to pursue their dreams and their passions is really what my overall community theme is, which is Love Bug Nation. In the interviews I've done, I often find that the, the viral sensation has to do a lot of work to sustain those, those connections. And you'll see that sometimes. You'll see somebody who goes viral and becomes sort of culturally famous for a moment in digital space, either through a newscast that ends up on, on YouTube and, and blows up, or one picture that everybody starts sharing all, all over the place, and, and then we find out who that person really is in the world, and they become influential. The internet was buzzing, wondering just who this cashier cutie might be. I went from 114 followers on Twitter to 350,000 in one night. 24 hours ago, no one. It was just like a normal cashier at Target. And then some girl took a picture of me. And I never saw her take a picture of me. But there was a group of girls that would come in and take pictures of me every once in a while. And I would notice it sometimes. But this one I didn't. My manager came up to me one day. It was on a Sunday, I remember. She came up to me and she was like, Have you seen this picture of you? It has like 20,000 retweets on Twitter. And I was like, No. I thought it was fake. Right. And then... That picture. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then about an hour later... Ellen reached out to me a couple days after that. I went on set for Ellen. That was terrifying because I was just some, like, kid that worked at Target. I had no, like, experience in that whole realm. And uh, it kind of just went from there. I got up to, like, 750,000 followers on Twitter in, like, a couple weeks. Uh, Two million on Instagram in a couple of weeks. It was, it was a roller coaster. I think the other way to look at this are normal people. I mean, people really who never intended to be entertainers or influencers in the first place, um, who were just having conversations about something they really cared about, whether it was a specific passion like gaming or um, sports or makeup, fashion.
there's so many different fields in which this has happened. And they just talk about them because they really want to connect with people about uh, you know, some aspect of their, of their interest. I created the blog at the first moment just as a passion, just like a hobby for the weekends. So I used to take pictures with my mom in the garden of my house. <laughs> and uh, just I shared the pictures only in the weekends, Saturdays and Sundays. But just as a hobby, like uh, because I always have liked fashion, I like uh, the clothes, how to combine different styles. I like fashion since I was little. I was always looking the magazines with my mom. I created the blog and then Facebook. Instagram was my last media, like uh, two years ago. But it has grown very fast, I think, because of the, the feeling with my followers. I'm always trying to answer them, all the questions that they have. I think that the, the most important thing for me is that they look at me like very natural. I can be like this with makeup, but I can also show them with a bunny, a bun here my, with my hair and a mask at night or when I wake up like, good morning, this is my morning face. So people want to, to know that, no? like more, to feel you like more close, not like a model or I'm not perfect and I don't pretend to be, I don't like it. I'm just Marta and I try to show them my daily lifestyle. It was my only passion uh, when I was a kid, I was playing soccer. And then when I was 18, uh, a doctor told me like, you need to stop because you, you have a, a problem, a genetic problem on the knees. And it was a big shock uh, for me because it was the only thing besides studying I was doing in my life. And I said like, how am I gonna do that? And then a door opened and said like, if you restrain strength, you work out your legs in the gym with certain exercise, you may recover your knee and you may keep training in the future for soccer or for everything. So I signed up with the gym. I met many people who helped me out to understand this amazing world like fitness, how eat better, how train harder, uh, what exercises are, are better than the other. Uh, so that became my, my, my passion. So when I moved here to Los Angeles, uh, any exercise I was doing, I posted. Anything, but I didn't trust at all in Instagram. I just did it because this girl, uh, she became my friend, she told me like, you need to do it. I said like, okay, she knows better than me how it's working in Los Angeles, so I'm gonna do it. But in few time, I saw the people respond, the people answer to all the tips, all the questions I post in, in Instagram, all the stuff, so I said like, oh, this is working, you know, this is truly working. And I was connecting with people from all around the world, which is fantastic. And that, in that point is when I discovered the, the, the potential of Instagram. So I took it serious and uh, I'm posting like very regularly, like three, four times a week uh, about tips of nutrition, uh, exercise, training, lifestyle. I think a lot of them had to come to realize that they had an influence that actually could be commercialized some way. I did it like a step by step and when I was about 50,000 or 60,000 on Instagram, that was the moment, the, the moment, the top, when I started like asking for money of course because I said I have these followers and I think that this has to be like a win to win. While that was happening, more and more companies, especially um, some you know really forward-looking companies, started to realize that this was an opportunity to talk to a demographic they were having a hard time reaching, whether you think of them as millennials, people who are sort of on the, the cutting edge of digital technology, they were harder to contact through those traditional media. And so they needed to figure out new ways um, to, to contact them in ways that felt authentic. So what we try to do is, is learn from influencers and learn from people who are online and, and finding audiences online and take whatever bit of authenticity or whatever piece of shareable that they've started to, to flourish and to create, how do we incorporate that into a brand message in a way that now when we make one of a piece of content for a brand, it doesn't feel like a commercial, it feels like a piece of entertainment that I really enjoy, it adds value to my life and I want to share it with my friends. The traditional model has moved away from what it is the old school commercial 30 second to a more you know digital 
based advertising, which is what we now call branded content. It has moved from trying to push in a 30 second spot a product to like, let me talk to you because as a brand, we understand what you are into and branded content creates this. It's more of a lifestyle content that is presented by a brand, more so than, hey, look, look at the brand. But what's interesting is that uh, a great social media campaign, influencer campaign, if it generates enough conversation, it then becomes newsworthy and then the earned media channels will pick it up. I was brought in initially uh, to manage digital content specifically for one of our clients, which is Lexus. Um, at that time, the idea was to create a, a, a portals for the Hispanic and the African American markets that would speak to that consumer beyond just buy this car or this is our brand. We really wanted to connect to that consumer. Uh, this is a luxury brand, so at a high level, at a lifestyle level. To give you an example, one of the pillars, as Lexus calls them, is music. Right now, Hispanics, we're very passionate about music. And through uh, people here at the agency, I was lucky to uh, be introduced to Pile Montilla, who was the creator and host of Vida Lexus Presents De Para Tres. This is a music show that, you know, day in the life of an up and coming alternative artist. And I find when I saw that, that uh, the concept was, was really organic. Uh, you know, Pili went from one place to another one in a vehicle. So to me, specifically thinking about Lexus, this was a perfect integration. She is a music lover and she talks to music lovers. And there's a very direct connection. Even though she's not a musician, she is a curator, a connoisseur of what's coming up. And so her audience trusts her. I've been very lucky to work with really high-end brands like Heineken, Starbucks, Lexus, and I've been very lucky to work with them because I think that their brands and my brand as Pili Montilla really go well together and that's why it works. You know, that's why it's like, okay, these are successful campaigns. My content is very, it's, it's really like my life. So it's very, it comes from a very genuine place. Um, it comes from really connecting with my followers and showing them what my life is like. When it comes to a brand, I really sit down with the brand and listen to what their purpose is and what the goal of that campaign is. And then through that information, then obviously the content that I put out there will relate to them as well as to me. I think influencers who are now being mentioned as you know the new kings of media and, and promotion, I think that I agree with it. I think that uh, in the last couple of years, we've seen how influencers are very important to marketing. However, the, the one thing that I will say is that when you look at an influencer, you gotta look beyond his numbers, beyond how many people he, he reaches. You know, it can have millions of followers. But if these are not followers that are actually interested in his message, sometimes it's tough to gauge that, right? And there's tools that we use in other production companies where you can see the top influencers and see the numbers. And that's one thing, but you need to meet them, one, for personality, and two, to make sure that these are actually talking to these audiences. So when we're advising clients or when we're doing research, anything we're finding now, everyone is talking about you've got to engage people with smaller followings, meaning that they're trying to find their tribe. This is me finding the person who I absolutely 100% relate to and I am inspired by, and therefore I'm more likely to make a purchase from them than this person who's got a bigger following. So instead of there being the one celebrity or the one YouTuber that everybody knows, sure, they still exist, right? Your PewDiePie, Michelle Fan, like, they're still out there. But what's more interesting to me and I think more indicative of what's new about, about influencers and in online spaces in general is that within certain niche communities and niche interests, you have those kinks. You have the person who is not, you know, God to everyone, but to this particular group of people who love this kind of music or love this kind of art or think this particular brand of humor is funny, they dominate. Advertisers and marketers feeling as if an influencer activation is pulling the wool over the eyes of anyone is delusional. Like, the viewers know this is a partnership. They know this is a brand thing. Um, so I think using the word authenticity, people often think like, oh, it doesn't look like an ad. No, consumers know 
that they're being paid for this or they're getting something from it. The FTC requirements have made it extremely clear that you have to basically beat people over the head of, with the fact that this is a partnership. The language that the FTC uses that requires uh, influencers to disclose that they have a, a relationship of some kind with the brand they're talking about, it has to be clear and conspicuous. The rule is basically that if your grandma in Iowa can't tell that this is an ad, you need to be more obvious about it. Like, it's a very low standard. So when we think about authenticity, it's not about fooling the customer, the consumer. Um, it's about it feeling like there's still validity in what the influencer is saying. It's kind of twofold. Number one is the content they are producing, their point of view on life, you know, what is their personal story? Um, is this a product they would or brand they would actually use or be open to? Or if not, is there a damn good super creative reason why and we're intentionally disrupting it? You should never try to deceive the consumer. What we see is there's nothing wrong with partnering with a brand, right? People understand the same way a television network has commercials, right? Or t a TV show has product placement. It's the same thing. But the way I like to look at it, it's almost like through the analogy of a, a professional surfer. You never look at a professional surfer and say, oh, you're being sponsored by Red Bull, that's so bad, right? Or you're being sponsored by Channel Islands, that's so bad. You always look at it and say like, wow, that's awesome. You're partnering with a brand that you really like, that you're associating yourself with, and so it's often a win-win. Because I'm very true to who I am and very true to that message, most brands know when they reach out to me, it definitely has to be not just a win for them, but for me, the thing that I'm always thinking about is how is this win going to be a win for my community? If I take care of my community and I also take care of the client, I know it'll be a win for me in the end. And if it's a great match, as I said, and it really meets a certain amount of criteria, uh, then I'm in. Discovering that I could make money out of all this and like really, um, wow, it was, it was insane. It was insane. It's like, what? Like, you really, you could just be yourself and, and get paid for it? What? That's cool. So I decided to keep going, just keep going, keep going and being myself and trying to be myself and find myself. Because these past six years, seven years, I really learned to discover me as a person, and as an entertainer, as a, as a father, as a YouTuber, as an as a influencer, a power Latino. I started attending conferences, I started, to t I started speaking at schools, I started getting to know other people, I started, you know, doing more on Facebook, on Instagram, and on Twitter, and really connecting with people and trying my best to really inspire families, kids, fathers, mothers, to remember that it's okay to be a dad, it's okay to have fun, it's okay to be yourself and to not follow trends, to not do what others do, but do you, you know? So, um, and a lot of brands that I worked with early on understood that and I really tried my to stay my ground and to be honest with myself and, and try to be real with people. 20 comments from uh, the video that I made for my wife, the one that is about, um, about her, about International Women's Day and um, her voice being my voice and I a lot of you a lot of you were writing <clears throat> and I, I don't know if it's new people I don't know if it's people that have been following. I think the primary reason for success for influencers is trust um, they build these communities in which they're in the center people subscribe to them and connect to them and follow their lives in a way that we've never been able to follow people's lives before even celebrities in movies we're playing somebody else. You know, the athlete on a field um, is taking on a role, but the, but the connection that you get through something like YouTube or Instagram or Facebook is is really them themselves. And so there's there's this trust and connection that comes from this sort of mass friendship that they build together. I think we live in a trust deficit now. So we have so much information, we don't know how to process it. And so what we look for is trust, and what we trust is people. And so we look at reviews to decide what movies we're going to download. We look at reviews to decide what restaurants we're going to eat at. We look at recommendations for which cars we're going to buy. So we, we really look to people to make almost every decision in our life. And so influencers are just one part of that. Influencers have the, the level of engagement they have with their audience because there's a sense of uh, friendship. How's it going everyone? PewDiePie here. Welcome to 
my very first non-gameplay video. Oftentimes, influencers start out just like any of us, where there's just uh, a kid putting a camera on um, in, in their bedroom um, and just giving it a shot. And I think people really relate to that because they feel like, oh, that could be me. Um, that could be my, my best friend, that could be my neighbor. The power of influencers is that they have this direct connection with their fans. Uh, they, the fans have been watching them who knows for how long. And they trust what they say and they follow what their suggestions are. They have to be a little careful with that power. Well, we're always looking for what's happening next and, uh, and trying to be aware of that. And we partner with lots of outside companies to help us be on the cutting edge. Whole companies have grown up in this space now who are intermediaries between brands and influencers. I'm 26 years old. I think I made it to the Forbes 30 Under 30 list uh, just because a lot of the traction we're getting in the space. We have a few awards and accolades from previous work we've done. And I think as well, the influencer marketing space is a very young space and has a lot of opportunity for young entrepreneurs to step up. Influencer is probably one of the most talked about words in marketing today. It started at a really low price point in 2010 um, and has been increasingly growing due to, you know, marketers and brands just seeing the, the value in it. And it's becoming more analytical in today's day and age um, to where brands are a little bit more savvy and influencers are also just as savvy as well because they're receiving deals um, left and right from different types of brands. I think in terms of if there's a bubble, um, I wouldn't consider it a bubble. I think I think the market will always will always work itself out, and there will always be a need for influencers. I think eventually uh, there's going to be a point where is there's more of a, a standard protocol instead of it being the wild wild west. At this point, there's no exact science to it.